welcome everyone to our policy discussion uh, on the theme of inequality and sustainability. Uh, so, with me today, you'll recognize him from the morning, you're recognizing because he has an office upstairs, Thomas Piketty, um, author of uh, several long books and one short one. And I can say, honestly, that I've read the short one all the way through. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, also uh, joining us today, uh, Orseta Kauza, who is Deputy Head of Division and Head of Labour Markets and Inequality Research in the Economics Department, the OECD. Orseta, welcome. Uh, Thomas, first of all, one of the things you said this morning is that for sustainable development, we require a reduction in top end living standards. Is that code for tax the rich and redistribute what you get? Uh, yeah, well, you can do it in various ways, but you know, but you know, the, the again, you know, the history of economic development for the past two centuries is an history going toward more socio-economic equality. So it took different forms. So taxation, you know, already at the time of the French Revolution, with the abolition of the tax privileges of the aristocracy, uh, uh, and also during the US Revolution, you know, the, so this movement toward equitable taxation is, of course, a very important part of, of the, you know, the 18th century uh, uh, revolution and the rise of modernity in general. So, uh, so it's a, you know, the people can caricature things, saying tax the rich, whatever, but, you know, the, the demand for uh, equitable taxation, you know, is sort of consubstantial to modernity. You know, the French Revolution, the US Revolution have this in, in common, but this goes well beyond taxation. So, you know, it, it, uh, throughout history, it can take the form of land reform, for instance, you know, redistribution of land, which played a very important role in very, uh, you know, various successful development experience the French Revolution to some extent, to a limited extent, more successful experience, you know, after World War II in completely different part of the world, in, uh, uh, you know, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, there was also very progressive taxation, but land reform, you know, played a major role to break up, you know, large concentration. of. So, yeah, it, it can take very, very different form. And sometimes, you know, the reform of the financial system, you know, can also allow to have uh, access to credit for, uh, you know, little uh, uh, producers or, you know, we are talking today about reform of the international financial system so that uh, poor countries, uh, you know, don't pay a huge interest rate in effect to rich countries through the financial system. So, you know, you have different tools. Taxation is one of them. Uh, direct redistribution of assets is, I think, key. Uh, financial reform is key. But, uh, yeah, you know, the distribution is, should not be taken as given. And, and because it has never been like that in the history of economic development, you know, it has been part of the discussion and actually a central part of the discussion. And again, you know, this, this movement toward this long run movement toward more equality is not just a, a dream, you know, it's a reality. You know, the world today is a lot more equal than a century ago, which itself was more equal than at the time of the French Revolution in many ways. And, and you know, things have been moving in this direction. And today, you know, there are completely new challenges but, you know, the common point with previous challenges is that they cannot be uh, addressed properly if we start from, the, uh, in my view, a very conservative uh, assumption that, you know, the distribution of power and the distribution of resources uh, will never change. Mm -hmm. it, it is interesting in the language we have distribu distribution and redistribution. You think, uh, you know, sort of assumes that distribution is the default uh, no, there's no default. You know, there's mm -hmm. no natural distribution of any kind. I mean, this is yeah. what, uh, uh, you know, some uh, large property owners would like to pretend. But in fact, you know, their, their position depends entirely on the state and, and the, 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 you know, the legal system, the, mm -hmm. uh, the jurisdictional system, and a certain way to organize property rights, you know, the ability to put your property right on uh, intellectual property, for instance. So, you know, the, the, the whole... Uh, 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 you know, collective construction of uh, state power and the legal system is, is absolutely part of what makes a certain distribution. So here, yeah, when I say distribution, redistribution, it's just to confront the current distribution with lots of alternative uh, uh, redistribution or alternative other distribution. But none of this distribution, whether the existing one or the other one, has anything particularly 
natural limits. They are all, uh, uh, they all depend on the institution mm -hmm. we choose and we should not naturalize uh, any, any of them. Uh, also, so, um, when we're talking about redistribution, then Tom, I used the word equitable. Um, how, from your research, does redistribution work within uh, the countries that you look at in your research at the moment? How well is it working? Well, um, first of all, I would like to say that, I mean, I'm going to speak about redistribution, but redistribution is one super important part of the story. Tax is one tool. But I think that um, we should be starting by the mere concept of equality of opportunities. Uh, if you take France, uh, France is a country that has pretty good redistribution via taxes and transfers uh, with relatively high market income inequality, which is due to high unemployment in part. And, and yet, if you look at uh, various measures of equality of opportunities, for example, the differences in PISA scores or PX scores according to socioeconomic background is it disastrous, disastrous. So it's a land of total inequality of opportunities in terms of education, and then there is a redistribution via tax and transfers, not even that much progressive. So um, there is a lot of that there is a lot of room, you know, for enhancing first inequality of opportunities. Of course, you're going to tell me, and I agree, that inequality of income and opportunities are linked. This is a great Gatsby curve. We know. But still, I think that's, that's really also the sense of fairness that people uh, perceive, even when redistribution by taxes and transfers is low. So I have done a number of papers on redistribution, and uh, one has been very comprehensive, in-depth, but just in terms of there is no in-kind redistribution in the paper. And what we observe that is really impressive is that in the vast majority of OECD countries, so let's say advanced countries, there has been a very strong decline in income redistribution. Um, and, uh, and the country where it declined the most in my sample huh, uh, is Sweden. So if you look at Sweden, there has been a, a really a, an impressive decline in the distribution. Of course, you can say, well, still, uh, Sweden is a high, uh, low inequality country. True, but much less than uh, 20 years ago and, uh, and with dramatic consequences, including on poverty, for example. Um, and then if you look at, uh, so there is a part about the progressivity of the tax system where I think uh, one has always in mind the progressivity of PIT, right? Personal income. But in fact, you have to look at all the tax system as a whole to look at the progressivity. And for instance, there is one area where I think we should be discussing much more, I mean, maybe we discuss, but in general, not us, is uh, the taxation of wealth. And in that respect, the taxation of inheritance, which I think is something that really policymakers should consider much more, but also consider to explain to people, because I mean, there is evident research showing that people have totally a misperception about how this works, who this affects, etc. And there are ways to make it progressive. And this would enhance progressivity of the tax system and also equality of opportunity, because if there is something at the root is really where you, know, where you come from, where you're living, what your parents were doing, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then another part is the transfer side. So if we simplify the world in taxes and transfers. And the transfer side is also a world of inequality. In my country, where I was born, in Italy, the bottom 40% of the distribution receive less than 10% of total transfers, the top, 40%, maybe there are not the top 000, but just to give you an idea, receive more than 40%. Oh. Because of the different features. Including pension? You know, Hello, uh, we, you can, uh, it's the working age pop, okay? Which means that there is no pension in principle, but it could be, okay? Be because you, you do have some people in the working age pop that could receive pension, but there is no way in the data that you can throw them away. What, what would it be that makes such a big result? If it's not because, because, well, b because there are various forms of transfers that are absolutely non-targeted. Uh, all the ones that are, let's say, insurance-based, unemployment benefits, disability, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are the ones that are universal. Uh, and in the middle, the ones that are sort of mean-tested. or And those ones, uh, for example, in Italy, they are basically peanuts. Oh, this is 2018. So before maybe Reduzione della Finanza, things may have improved because this is where the data stop. But Italy is one example that you know, I was very <laughs> impressed about, but it's not the only country. And the US is another country like that. Um, so maybe if we include in-kind transfers, things would improve. Certainly they do. But 
probably not that much. So here we have mm -hmm. a lot of work to do. And one of the consequences of this mechanism has been during the crisis, the energy crisis, the support that countries have put on the table in advanced economies because they would have the money to do so has been largely untargeted and price-based. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is something that we've been, okay, we know targeting is not easy, but it's not enough to say that targeting is not easy. And um, that's, and you know, there is lots of data that policymakers can use. Uh, and this is clearly something that, uh, you know, I mean, I want to relate the two things. One is historical, the, the, the second one is very, is very much anchored in the present and still the case and costs also a lot of money that could be used in a much more equitable and efficient way. That to be able to reform that, though, there has to be a political will, and there does not seem to be a widespread political will, that social democratic platform that you talked about at the moment, either whether you talk about it in Italy, across Europe, across developed countries at the moment. Well, there is a difference. About the, the, the philosophy, if you mm -hmm. want, I agree with you. I mean, with the current government in Italy... Uh, but uh, about the current situation, about the targeting or not, I think now countries have no choice. I mean, they have to withdraw the, the, the you know, the, the, the super mm -hmm. uh, whatever it takes and be more targeted because otherwise, from a fiscal perspective, they're going to be punished. If, 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 if there is just one reason, it's this one. Okay. And actually, we observe, we tend to observe that it is going slowly, slowly, you know, the shift between the two, the balance is going to decrease slowly, slowly in favor of more targeting. But still, if you look at, we have lots of reports on that in the OECD and I've been working on some kind of classification, which of course is not simple, but still it's very clear what's happening. Mm -hmm. And this I, think, this I think can change, but it won't change the whole philosophy probably. Uh, this is like the, the, the energy part. Mm -hmm. um, well, with energy prices going probably to remain elevated for a certain time, even if not exploding like they, they have been, maybe you know we should think better how to uh, mitigate the purchasing power effects on uh, people that have no choice mm -hmm. in the short run at least so how do we change the whole philosophy yeah. well for, you know we have to be careful about you know sometimes we feel there is some uh, agreement about principles or objectives like equality of opportunity, which is supposed to be, you know, the common uh, philosophy that everybody is, is supposed to agree about. But then in practice, you know, when my experience is that when you try to make concrete proposal to go more in the direction of equality of opportunity, so for instance, you know, I, I remember my own experience, you know, when I wrote about the redistribution of inheritance, you know, which will be, uh, you know, so the proposal I was making, you know, in my brief history of equality is simply to have uh, uh, everybody at age 25 will receive 120,000 euros, which is you know 60% of average inheritance. And this will be paid for by a combination of progressive inheritance tax and progressive wealth tax, which is a way I think will always raise more money than progressive inheritance tax. And, and I think uh, I mean, maybe we can come back to this, but we really need to have the two together. It's very important. But anyway, the, the proposal, in effect, you know, in my view, was not going very far. This was saying, okay, the bottom 50% or bottom 70% who today receive close to zero, they will have 120,000. And the people who today receive 1 million, you know, they go down to 600. So it's not, you know, it's not complete uh, equality of opportunity. It's still enormous inequality. And if you want my opinion, I think we could go much further than this. But then... You know, the kind of reaction I had uh, confronting, you know, lots of, uh, you know, center right or center left people, you know, who were in principle in favor of uh, equality of opportunity was to tell me, oh, no, but don't don't do that. You know, all these poor children, you know, they're going to do uh, stupid things with the money. You don't want to give them 120,000 euros, you know, as if the rich children were always making uh, clever things, you know, when they receive millions and billions. And here you can see the limit of the rhetoric on equality of opportunity. That at a purely theoretical level, people say they are for equality of opportunity, but then when you make concrete proposal, like substantial redistribution of inherited wealth, which again, you know, is not going very far because with the thing I was proposing, you know, you, stay, you know, bottom 50% will receive only 120,000 and top 10% on average will still have 600,000 after the tax. So it's still, you know, the, the most obvious form of inequality of opportunity you can think of. But people were telling me, oh, no, this is too much. And then when many people, you know, do uh, 
proposal about, uh, about a minimum inheritance, they come with ridiculously small number, like giving 5,000 or 10,000 euros. You know, I remember a blanche article paper for Macron uh, saying that, which, you know, is, is fine. But, you know, given that average wealth is 200,000 euros, if you give 5,000, uh, you know, which is 2.5% uh, uh, of average wealth, Uh, you know, by construction, you're, you know, the share of total wealth owned by the bottom 50% is almost not going to change. It, it used to be 4%, it's going to be uh, 5%, but, you know, it's as if you were proposing a minimum income that was, uh, you know, 2% of average income uh, uh, and then, you know, 20 euros per month or 50 euros per month. And then uh, uh, people, uh, you say, well, you know, that's not much. And people tell you, oh, but that's a good start. You know, we have to start somewhere. Well, you know, at some point you have to be serious. Are you, do you want to redistribute or do you want to sort of pretend that you redistribute? And so, you know, I'm all with you with equality of opportunity in terms of principle. But then the question is, do we, are, are we serious about it? Or are we just pretending? And, uh, you know, so this is true for the redistribution of inheritance. This is true, of course, for education. Because, you know, why is it that in France uh, we have so much inequality of opportunity in education? Well, because we have a state system of educational finance, you know, which is putting three times more resources per student going to the grand école than the students, you know, going to the normal university track. And even at the primary school or secondary school system, you know, there's excellent research work by a, a former PhD student from PSC, uh, Asma Benanda, you know, showing that the average wage uh, 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 for teachers in primary school and secondary school in France, uh, uh, including, you know, experience, you know, the full wage, uh, all the bonuses, everything paid by the uh, government to teachers, average wage, is actually a rising function, and very steeply rising function of the proportion of socially advantaged uh, kids uh, in, the, in, the, in the school. And, and you know, the little bonuses that are given uh, to, to, uh, to teachers uh, in, uh, in disadvantaged school are in fact uh, very small as compared to the fact that you know, the most experienced teachers uh, with the highest degree are in the center of Paris uh, rather than the most disadvantaged area. And in the most disadvantaged area, you have like 50% of contract teachers who are paid much less than the statutory teachers. So here, you know, this is an example where the, in effect, state redistribution is in fact, you know, going in the wrong direction. So, you know, again, uh, yeah, equality of opportunity, sure, let's do it. But we have to, you know, to measure what we do, we have to have clear objectives. Uh, for the redistribution of inheritance, for redistribution of educational spending. And I think too often, you know, we use this concept in a, in a way that is, uh, you know, that is a bit vague and, and that is sometimes used, in fact, as an excuse to reduce existing redistribution no, rather no. than to promote more redistribution. No, I, I, yeah, I, I see the point about an excuse. Actually, when, well, it's no secret, when Trump was... Uh, was uh, president of the United States, and I was working at the OECD. Uh, we could, we could not write inequality. In I had to change control H inequality of opportunities. Opportunity they didn't want to, to speak. So oh. I, I totally agree on that point. But still, I, I, I still believe that inequality of opportunity is important. Uh, but so also are you in favor of redistribution of inheritance, 120,000 euros. I I, I think age 25. That, I think yes. I I am in favor. But look at the reality. Look at the way people react. To inheritance taxation. Look at what happened Because in. They want to have inheritance. No. I also propose minimum inheritance of 120,000 euros. Here, I'm not proposing to tax. I'm proposing to give. If you give 120,000 yes, euros, yes, but you're redistributing all, between the poor and the rich. Well, no, but you are, first you give to the poor and in fact to the vast majority of the population. So that's the thing, you know. If you only have the, the you know, the taxation, uh, two things about the taxation. First, I think it's very important to say what you do with the money. To, so to start with the minimum inheritance rather than the tax in itself is very important. The other thing, and I think we should discuss about this, is that, you know, I think people in all countries prefer wealth tax, billionaire tax, typically than the inheritance tax. And many economists uh, disagree with this. I think this is an example where the average voter and public opinion actually have more common sense than economists. You know, this happened many times, in fact, that's quite common. But on this example, I think, you know, inheritance tax, of course, is good. 
but you don't want to have everything at the time of inheritance because you know look assume i received uh, uh, you know an apartment in paris from my parents in 1972 that was worth 100000 euros at the time nobody could guess at the time in 1972 that it will be worth 5 million euros today and that the rental income equivalent will be 10 times the minimum wage today so in a tax system where you only tax at the time of inheritance ouais, And, and you don't have a, an annual wealth tax all your life. In fact, you, even from an efficiency perspective, you don't have the right policy tool. And I think there are deep, good reasons. You know, once you introduce a liquidity constraint, capital market imperfection, why, in fact, most of the tax revenue is going to come from an annual wealth tax. So like, just to make it clear, uh, for the, the minimum inheritance I was describing, it's, this costs 5% of national income, so this is not uh, It's not negligible. Yeah. And 1% in the financing scheme I was proposing will come from inheritance tax, and 4% from annual uh, wealth tax. And if you want substantial redistribution, I think you will have to rely on the, on the progressive wealth tax uh, Uh, so, so what I mean is that you know you need to have also ambitious redistributive objective. Otherwise, if you just uh, and again, if you only tax inheritance without taxing, uh, uh, you know, taxing billionaire or millionaire is much more popular than taxing inheritance. And I think it's important that experts uh, at OECD or everywhere else, you know, try to understand why people feel this way. And I think there are actually good reasons why annual millionaire billionaire tax is always going to raise more money, annual property tax than, than inheritance tax. Okay, so two points. The first one is that uh, the inheritance taxes can be designed in a way that it's a lifelong process. You know, there is this idea that uh, you would be taxed on all the grants, not the grants, the, 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 you know, the cadeau that your parents are, you know, the, all the transfers, the intergenerational transfers, and at the, at the moment of the disease of the donor. So basically, that would, of course, it's more complicated because there are valuation effects. But this is a principle that, you know, could allow to address the problem you were previously, no, no. because you're accumulating over time, you know, I have... Yeah. Yes, but then, okay, take, take uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, assume oh, he, has, he has accumulated, you know, say, uh, 100 billion dollars at age 30, and he's going to transmit this, you know, when he dies at age 90, you know, in 60 years from now. Uh, no, but it's uh, on the recipient, it's on the recipient. No, okay, but assume there's no recipient ah, okay. uh, for the next 60 years. So you get no tax from Mark Zuckerberg? So, so that's why, you know, you need an annual wealth tax because, you know, you, what, uh, even if you do what you say, taking into account from the recipient side everything you receive during your entire life, you know, if there's no recipient for the next 60 years, uh, uh, what no. are you going to do? You're going to wait uh, uh, for Mark Zuckerberg to die to start making him pay tax? You know, that's a bit too long. Uh, no, so I, I don't want to kill Mark Zuckerberg, I'm no, no, but, uh, <laughs> You may... <laughs> no, but that's... Uh, So, no, but that's why I'm saying, you know, especially in a world with very long life expectancy, inheritance tax, you know, is yeah. not going to be enough. It's good. I'm all in favor of inheritance tax, of course. But, you know, I think there's a trick sometimes in the, in the rhetoric of, say, of saying, and actually Macron used it a lot, which was to say, oh, you know, we are going to get rid of the wealth tax, but at some point we will increase the inheritance tax because that's a really equitable tax. But then you, you get rid of the wealth tax and then you say, oh, but too bad, people don't like the inheritance tax. I'm not going to be able to raise the inheritance tax. Oh, this is really bad. And then you, you have nothing at all left. So, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a rhetoric of trying to put everything on the inheritance tax, which, because we know from the beginning it's unpopular, largely for good reason which is that, you know, I think because of liquidity problem, paying a very large tax just at the time your parents die, you know, it can be complicated. Yeah, but there are, ways, there are ways Whereas, to address this. No, but the annual wealth tax is a far superior tool for efficiency reason, redistributive reason. So, and, and also it's more popular. So, you know, if we, if we want to redistribute, let's go for a tool that is more popular, more efficient, uh, you know, more redistributive. But then can I ask a question? Why, I mean, I am not... Uh, And unfavorable to net wealth taxes. But first, there is the economist argument that rich people will say about double, triple, quadruple taxation, because you have taxation of capital gains, and how you tax capital gains is super important when you assess the three things together, you see? So on the, the, the advantage of inheritance taxes is that rich people cannot say that it's double taxation when it's on the donor, okay? Because the guy... Okay. <laughs> okay. No, at all. And then... Uh, <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then, no, but now, no, and then, yes, and then why, so first of all, there is this, you know, you have to look at the, 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 the wealth taxation 
in concomitance with the way you tax capital income, okay? For efficiency, equity reasons. And then the second thing is that, why is it then the case? How can you then explain well, the reason that there is almost, I think, four countries now that tax wealth? I mean, it, okay, I'm so... i take your two arguments when... Uh, okay, 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 thank you. Okay, so let's, let's, let's go. <laughs> So let's start with the first one. You're saying I'm very concerned about the double taxation or triple taxation of the rich. Uh, no, but look, this could be a serious concern. Uh, I think we live in a world where the main problem is not the risk of double or triple or quadruple taxation of the rich. I think the main risk is zero uh, taxation. So, you know, look, we have data on this. You know, now we have lots of countries, you know, in, in the US, uh, they ProPublica published the federal income tax return of the top 400 billionaires. You know, on average, uh, they were paying 1% of income tax as a fraction of their total increase in their wealth in the past 10 years. Uh, the New Zealand Treasury Department had an official study looking at the income tax paid by the highest wealth owners in New Zealand. They got the same result. IPP in France, you know, computed, they got the same result. So we all, know, and in fact, we knew it before, to be honest. We already knew it from... Uh, you know, a long time ago, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, when you have very high wealth, the income you get as an individual for the income tax is a ridiculously small fraction of your wealth. You know, you, you own billions and you have an income in millions. So, you know, there's a number of zero that are missing. So if you have, if you have an income that is a negligible fraction of your wealth, you know, you can have an income tax as much as you want, you know, 100% if you want, but because it's a ridiculously small tax base, that's not going to get you anywhere. So it's clear that only the wealth tax can address this. We know it from the beginning. So again, the, the, your concern about double, triple taxation, I think is completely out of place here. Here, we, our problem is the zero taxation problem. Then, uh, you know, the second argument you mentioned is, look, we don't have well, too many wealth tax in the world, therefore, uh, this is the proof that uh, we should not have a wealth tax. I'm sorry, Arceta, but I think this is... Uh, no, no, well, that's what you said. Uh, and so I'm sorry to tell you that this is, in my view, I might be wrong, but a very, very weak argument because, you know, 100 years ago, you know, around 1900, there was no income tax in any country. There was no income tax in the US, there was no income tax in France, there was no income tax in Britain, there was no income tax in Germany. And at the time, I can tell you, lots of economists in France everywhere were saying, well, look, you are dreaming, you know, income tax does not exist anywhere, so this is the proof that it should not exist and that it will never exist. Except that then it did exist. And, you know, it didn't work so badly. And 100 years later, I don't think you're proposing to abolish the income tax. So I think, you know, these arguments of saying, look, this does not exist right now, therefore this should never exist. You know, I think it's important at some point to have a discussion that's based on principles and objectives and the common good. And, and, and here, you know, given what we know about the effective taxation of top wealth group right now, you know, which is really ridiculously small, you know, it's very important that everybody is in her or his own position. You know, of course, we are not going to decide alone. This will depend on the democratic process. It's a complicated process. You have lobbyist group. But as, you know, expert or economist or intellectual, I think we have to, to defend what, what, you know, we feel given the evidence we have is right. And in this case, uh, you know, how do you want to have a decent rate of taxation for this very top wealth group without a wealth tax? I think there's just no way. Uh, and, and, you know, again, it's, it's, it's you know, some, I'm not saying we are going to solve every problem in the world by having this, you know, that's not enough money, but first, it is a decent amount of money. So, you know, if we look at the actual numbers of top fortune, you know, the idea that there's no serious money to get there is wrong. And people who, who say that don't, uh, can, you know, don't know how to count. And, you know, if, they, if you look at the numbers on top wealth group, you know, there's actually a tax base that is substantial. That's point number one. Point number two, you know, if you don't ask uh, uh, an effort to people at the top, which is in proportion to their ability to pay and to contribute to the common good, you know, what are you going to do with the middle class and the upper middle class and the lower class? And, you know, they're going to tell you, look, I'm tired to pay more than people who are at the top. And then gradually, you know, you sort of destroy the very basis for fiscal consent. And, you know, that's something I tried to, to argue in my talk this morning, is that the, the rise of the welfare state and the social state of, in, the, in the 20th century was possible 
because at the same time there was very progressive taxation so that uh, you know, of course, everybody had to pay. I'm not saying that only the top was paying for the welfare state. That would be ridiculous. Of course, the middle class, the low one, had to pay social contribution. But at least these people knew that people at the top were paying more than they did. And it was sort of much easier to construct fiscal consent. So, I, you know, I think today it's, it's really important to try to rebuild some kind of fiscal consent. And I, I simply don't see how this can happen without, you know, a strong defense of the... Uh, wealth tax at the top. Yeah, so la I, last I, word on this also, so then we have to talk about corporate taxation as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, no, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just wondering, first of all, okay, then it's our job to, to better explain how this works and why, you know, there has been a repeal of wealth taxation, right? There was a number of countries having wealth taxation and then it has been abandoned progressively. So that, that's, that's one point and there are various reasons for that, good and bad probably, but that's one point to take into account. And then also... It's the very popular. You know, if you ask him, you know, you were mentioning the popularity, you have opinion polls, even in the US, you know, uh, including in the Republican electorate, and of course in the Democratic electorate, you ask about the billionaire tax, and same thing in France, in Europe. There was an international survey that was conducted uh, in part with OECD by Adrian Fabre and other researchers, uh, asking at the global level, you know, do you want a global wealth tax? It's, it's hugely popular. So if it's hugely popular, Plus, we know that this is the only way to, to get a you know, decent rate of taxation at the top. Why are you hesitating? Well, but I think that the point is also, okay, imagine that this happens. What are you doing with the money? I mean, will this leave people out of poverty in advanced economy? I mean, how will you redistribute the money is also a matter, right? Yeah, so so the, the, education problem, the education problem is obvious, you know, and that's not probably not only a matter of how much you spend, but how do you allocate, as you were saying, right? Between, you know, it's regressive allocation of uh, educational spending. Okay, okay but you know, you're, you're, not, you're not going to reduce too much, you know, if, you, if you're saying in, in, in the French education system, I think the key is to invest more, you know, in the, in the schools and, and universities that receive less education. Yes. You know, you're not going to cut enormously what you redistribute in the top schools. I mean, you could cut a little bit, but I think mostly the right policy is to increase what you invest uh, uh, in the middle or bottom of the distribution in terms of educational resources. So you're telling me what are we going to do with the money? Well, you know, I, <laughs> there are lots of things. Yeah, no, me too. Money. I have you ideas. Can, you can redistribute inheritance. You know, you can have a minimum inheritance. You know, that's already 5% of national income. Just to have a little bit of equality of opportunity which I thought you were in favor of. So, Absolutely. So you're asking me what are we going to do with the money? No, I mean, yeah. what you and I are going to do with the money, maybe we have, you know, views about progressivity in the yeah. system or, uh, you know, equality of opportunity, but uh, politicians, uh, I'm not sure. No, but you're not here to defend what, what bad politicians might do. You're here to describe what you think will be a good policy to do. Okay, I was trying to be more, like, realistic, but a little bit pessimistic, maybe. Uh, sometimes being realistic can be a way to, to, to be conservative, you know, because you don't, you, you know, you have to be... No, oh, no conservative. Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, you're telling me, well, what are we going to do with this money if we have a billionaire tax? You know, in effect, you're putting all the argument to explain why this is not useful. No, uh, that's a fact, I'm sorry. Guys, guys we, we have to move on now to discuss the non-controversial topic of corporate taxation. <laughs> yeah, what are we going not to? So sure about that. <laughs> not so sure about that either. <laughs> and what are we going to do about that? Because that is in something where the OECD has been trying to lead, and it has been a very long journey to get to where we are with BEPS now. How successful do you feel that has been? Well, I, feel I should let Orseta. Uh, 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 I mean, I don't want to be too harsh with what was done at OECD. So you know, if you. Yeah, I mean, there are some positive, uh, you, know, you know, do you want to start? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, so first of all, I haven't been involved, you know, in person in the BEPS, but uh, many of my colleagues have. And, uh, and so I can say that he's a, it has been a very painful journey uh, in the sense that uh, there was a very, you know, there was a very strong willingness, for example, by a guy like Pascal Saint-Amand that uh, has then left uh, the OECD uh, to really achieve more, uh, tax fairness, uh, more transparency, less tax avoidance, uh, of course, uh, the, the profit erosion. Uh, and it took, I mean, when we started the BEPS, which was after the financial crisis, and partly because of, the, you know, le learning from the financial crisis, nobody would believe in that. I mean, it was like, 
you know, c'est n'importe quoi, you're never going to arrive nowhere. And, and then it took a lot of time, but we achieved this signature of the two pillars. Now, I know, and you're going to tell me, that there are holes, there are problems in these two pillars. Um, one Could being, you explain the two pillars for the people who don't know? Uh, one is about uh, allocating parts of the profits that multinational, uh, allowing multinationals to be taxed uh, not related to their physical presence, okay? Uh, and so there is an allocation of taxing rights. Uh, and the second one is uh, having a minimal corporate tax of 15%. So if you have a corporate tax in your country less than 15%, there, there, will, there will be a top up that will go back to uh, the, 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 that's one problem, to the country of the headquarters of the multinational. Okay, um, this is just to say it super easily, but it's extremely complicated and there are lots of, you know, tricks in that, etc. So, but it has been a very, very long negotiation. And I can say that uh, the OECD was not, uh, I mean, would have been favorable to a higher than 15% for sure. Um, and, uh, and, but this has really been a matter of putting countries around the table, uh, having to negotiate for years with the United States. The United States was particularly aggressive about uh, the digital, because the digital uh, big firms are in the US. And, and so I just want to say that voilà, th this is clearly something that uh, you know, is perfectible. And actually, the negotiations are ongoing. And it could well be that you know, the, the loopholes that are in this system uh, and we can speak about them, and I'm sure Thomas will speak about them, and I, I am aware of them, they could be addressed by the voice of developing countries. Because there is a problem also of capacity building in developing countries that colleagues of mine have really explained to me several times that you know countries have little capacity to address and to manage these complicated things. And so now we have these international tax inspectors, what, uh, inspectors without borders that go there. So probably you know when capacity building improves, uh, it will be possible, I hope, to make progress with, you know, towards more. I think here really the problem is really between emerging and uh, advanced economies, and this is where I think uh, progress uh, should be should be made. And this is regardless of the top one percent, etc. It's really a matter of the, the allocation of taxing. Yeah. So you know, I want to be optimistic, and you know, the fact that there was an agreement, you know, is is, is a sign that the the idea of a possibility of a discussion about an international coordinated tax system is making progress and I, you know I think the, we will we'll need to go much further but you know I, I think that's in itself that's interesting now there are many problems with what has been decided you know the tax rate minimum tax rate of 15 percent is, is far too small there are many ways to get around it lots of technical exceptions so that in effect you can end up paying 10 or 5 or 0 the last problem, which is even more important than the first two, is that the countries in the south were largely forgotten. So, you know, the, if you look at the formula, the way it was organized, this is really a game between the country in the north to, to split the decision. I think this has to do with the fact, I mean, you're not responsible for that or set that the OECD, you know, is a, is a rich country club, whatever, whatever you, you, you can say about this. And so other countries in the south were invited in the room to sit with a, a strapontin, as we say in French, you know, uh, but they, they, they are not really part of the of the of the club, and uh, you know I think from the beginning we should have uh, uh, you know different perspective where uh, basically some in my view you know some of the tax revenue on multinationals but more generally on the most powerful uh, economic actors in the world top wealth individual billionaire top income individual, uh, uh, but we can start with multinationals, that's a good target. Uh, part of the tax revenue from this group should go to uh, 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 countries in the south, to all countries in proportion to their population. You know, I think at some point we'll have to get there, uh, in particular if we want to be serious about the climate reparation, because you know all the discourse about the climate reparation where countries in the north say, okay, we will give you, you know, 100 million. In fact, they should give 1,000, of course, but, but in, they don't even give the 100. And each year we have this stupid discussion, you know, saying, oh, oh, that's too bad. We are still not at the 100 target. We will discuss more next year. You know, at some point, this has to become automatic. You know, this is, it cannot just be uh, rich countries who decide, you know, uh, how much they want to give each year. You know, this has to come 
automatically from 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 the international tax system. So this will have part of the of the tax revenue will have to be allocated in proportion to to population. So now maybe you know you could say that's a dream. This will never happen. You know I think at some point this will have to happen, especially in the bigger discussion about uh, about climate change and, and you know the, the the amounts that we are talking about just to compensate you know countries in the south for the damage caused by climate change you know are, are really gigantic and and you, it will take a big fraction of total corporate tax revenue to be to be uh, to redistributed to to all countries in proportion to of population and it could also take other criterion including exposure of course to, to climate change but you know the two have to be combined um, uh, you know so here there's, a, there's really a lot more to do now last thing i want to say about this is uh, in order to make progress on this front you know i think individual you know countries individual countries can uh, make unilateral actions in order to make progress in this direction. And we cannot always just use as an excuse the fact, oh, we would so much like to go further, but unfortunately, other countries do not agree. And the way to do it was actually uh, analyzed very well uh, uh, by, uh, well, for Emmanuel Saez and Gabriel Zutman in, in their book, uh, The Triumph of Injustice, uh, uh, that they published in 2020 in the US, and, and, and the European Union Tax Observatory, which is now based at the Paris School of Economics and supervised by Gabriel, uh, published last year, uh, or, or the year before, uh, yeah, well, one of their first reports, you know, they, they published a report showing how each individual country can actually recover some of the tax deficit. So take a very concrete example, to be very concrete. Assume the minimum tax rate is 15% or 10%, whatever, and assume a country like France or it could be Germany, you know, wants to have a tax rate uh, on, of 25 or 30% on their own territories. And so the firms that are based in France pay, uh, say, uh, you know, 25, uh, and the minimum tax rate is only 15. From the point of view of France, you know, there's a 10% tax deficit, you know, which means that countries, uh, uh, firms that are based in other countries, that are based in Ireland, that are based in uh, uh, other parts of the world, that are producing goods and services and exporting them to France, you know, they are paying only 15% corporate income tax, whereas their competitors that are located in France pay 25, there's a 10% uh, tax deficit. What do we do? according to the proposal that was made in the European Union Tax Observatory report. I'm not quite sure the European Commission was happy with the proposal, but <laughs> anyway, the proposal was, well, you're going to charge unilaterally, uh, France, for instance, should decide to charge this tax deficit uh, in proportion to the goods and services that are sold by this company. So you take a multinational company, you compute their global profit, you look at the share of their sales of goods and services that are sold in France, and this is the fraction of the tax deficit that France should receive, well, you just make it pay at the time the goods and services are sold. So now, after you've said that, many people will say, oh, but you know, you are reintroducing tariffs. Well, yes and no. This is not exactly like a tariff because the difference with the tariff is that if the other country, say Ireland, increase their tax rate from 15 to 25%, the tariff will disappear. So it's not like a tariff, it's an incentive so that the other countries raise their corporate tax rate to 25%. I think this is the only way we will make progress. Okay, if we wait for agreements, this, this will simply not happen. So we have to do this. Now, many countries will say, oh, but this was not planned, uh, you know, in the European Union Treaty to do things like that. This was not planned in the World Trade Organization Agreement. Yes, well, I'm sorry, you know, there are lots of things that were not planned before and at some point have to change. And it's not because you made mistakes, you know, in a treaty that was signed a couple of decades ago that we need to wait another century before changing them. And so, I, you know, I really think, uh, 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 and, and this raises a lot of money. So according to the European Union Tax Observatory report, so to take this example, France put, uh, applying 25%, so not even 30, 35, 40, just 25%, to other companies exporting to France would raise, according to this report, 26 billion euros for, for French treasury. So, you know, this puts a strong incentive for other countries to do the same. And I think this is the right strategy, you know, to, to get move. Now, of course, it's even better if all countries in Europe agree directly uh, to 25, but we know this is not going to happen. So you have to set target. You say, okay, if in six months we all agree about 25, that's fantastic. 
Otherwise, I start doing that, and then we enter a different. Game. So, to me, you know, that's the only way to, to get rid of the bad equilibrium. Or otherwise, we, you and me will be talking about uh, oh, too bad, we don't have an agreement for 25 uh, in five years, in 10 years, and you know, we will not be making any progress. It will be very, very entertaining if you are. Uh, also, so one more, what, yeah, one more comment, and then I'll take some questions. Yeah, no, I don't want, I don't want to be long on that. Well, first, I think it's a little bit unfair to say that it's only rich countries. I mean, I was looking now because I don't remember, but there, w there was uh, 137 countries that have signed the BEPS. And what fraction of the tax revenue? What fraction of the tax extra tax revenue are they going to get? Well, on this, I don't have the number and I don't want to give it to you. You know why? I because I think... It's less than 0.5%. Really the, the problem with that is that also the, the numbers about estimating the impact of BEPS are a little bit over the place. I don't trust them that much, even in general. Do you know whether it's 0.5% or substantial amount? Bon, alors, for, for me, for me the, the problem, uh, I, I mean, what I see myself personally, and I don't speak on behalf of the OECD, as a problem is, is the, this, this problem of the allocation of taxing rights and the fact that the money goes to rich countries, basically. Um, and this, this is, I think, a point where we can make progress. I mean, you could well imagine that the extra of the 15% or whatever uh, does not go to the headquarters, but is allocated in proportion of the profit made in each country. That's not enough. You have to take it around population. If you, if you only take, otherwise you will not get much. I don't know, how, but it's, it's much better in any case. And I think there are discussions if ongoing, There I are think simulations showing that this will... At so, you know, if you're talking of really poor countries, they will never uh, be a big share of the yeah, of the yeah. sales or the profit. So at some okay. point, if you care about individual uh, uh, access to education, health, etc., you have to look at individuals as uh, individuals. You know, even if they live in uh, in Mali or in a very poor country, so you have to take population. So I know it's a complete change in philosophy, but. I think that's what it takes if we want to to have a significant share of the tax revenue to the. But then, country. but but then I then I would do something different. I mean, I would then I I would um, there was a, the speech by Esther Duflo yesterday evening. You know, the panel discussion, and she has this idea which is similar to yours, and I think it's a it's a nice one. I mean, I, I totally agree. Is you know, eventually she was saying, okay, let's have a higher uh, threshold and let's redistribute this part, irrespective of multinational, non-multinational, this part is going to be redistributed to developing countries. For instance, for climate adaptation and mitigation. And this, but this is really like, okay, we commit ourselves that we do the BEPS, we do the things of the BEPS, etc. And then th this extra part goes, uh, you know, redistribution across countries. This is a very nice idea. And for me, this is not impossible to achieve. Uh, and I think it would be probably also be more acceptable, uh, hopefully. More acceptable than what? Uh, than than the, the than the than your unilateral uh, sort of proposal of you know reinstoring something that looks like a tariff, and and also that could you know that could in, in, that could uh, imply you know the, the the beginning of a smallish trade war and uh, you know I don't say trade war but you see what I mean I mean politically it could be in, in Europe it would be very difficult. Well, but, but I think that's exactly the discussion we need to have. You know, the problem is that you're not going to have, uh, you, you can see how difficult it was, you know, at OECD, we've been talking about this for 10 years, or in fact 20 years, or 30 years, <laughs> and even this 15% tax rate, you know, is still not applied. So, so you can tell me, okay, this is going to work in the next five years, we're going to get to 25, 30, but... You know, to be honest, I, I think this is not really... So that's why, you know, this unilateral thing, to me, is the only way just to make progress and will put incentives on other countries. So I think it will not remain unilateral for very long. Yeah, the I whole thing is that this will put incentive on other countries to, to recover themselves some of this tax deficit. Because in effect, if they don't do it, they let the first mover countries collect all the, 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 ta the tax deficits. I, you know, I don't know. Here, again, I'm, I'm supporting this very strongly. I'm not initially the author of that. You know, this is really something that uh, Gabriel Emmanuel have been pushing very strongly, and, and I have become very convinced by that. And, uh, um, yeah, I think this is, uh, you know, otherwise uh, the search for uh, unanimity or large coalition is likely to be an excuse for, again, for not, not 
doing much. Mm. I will just say then probably uh, we we'll get in touch and we invite them uh, defending this view at uh, at the OECD in a seminar. Okay. Oh, I look, I, I look yeah. forward to seeing that, guys. Yeah, we we, uh, we need to take uh, some questions. I hope we got, I hope we got some questions. And just remember, everyone, on the worst hour of the worst day of your working lives, just think to yourself: I'm not involved in the BEPS negotiations. So, do we have a, do we have any questions? Yes, what well, there? Uh, thank you very much for the interesting debate. Um, I was wondering, if, um, I had a question on the wealth tax. So, I often hear in Germany as a counter argument that the wealth is usually embedded in small and medium sized companies, and then if you tax them, this harms the economy and harms them, and they cannot invest in digitalization and climate protection and so on. Do you think this is a good argument? First question and second question. Um, if it is not in, in companies, then it's often movable, like movable capital. And then also some rich people say, well, um, we move to Switzerland. Or of course, we also know those tax evasion um, strategies to just um, transfer money to, to tax havens. Um, are you optimistic? that the international community is also able to tackle this issue of tax evasion and if not of moving somewhere else given that we want to probably keep our free society where we can move wherever we want. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you mean the, the, the freedom to, to use, uh, to transfer your billion uh, in other countries, but you know, I mean, there's also the freedom of other people, you know, who are not billionaires, you know, to receive uh, 120,000 euros as a minimum inheritance. So, you know, I think it's important if we care seriously about freedom to look at equal freedom, you know, equal opportunity to look at the freedom of everyone, not just uh, the freedom of billionaires, you know, to, to accumulate wealth uh, using the public infrastructure of a country, the public education system of a country, and then pushing a button and, and sending the wealth at a place where nobody can uh, ask you to pay a tax uh, in proportion to what you have accumulated. You know, I think this is a very strange notion of freedom, which has been built in the international uh, legal system through, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, rules about free capital flows without any counterpart in terms of taxation, regulation, uh, environmental, uh, you know, implications. And again, I think this, were, uh, this was a mistake. You know, I, I think we've gone far too far in this direction. Uh, you know, it's good to move around investment. I think it will be good to let, uh, you know, people move around more easily rather than just capital. Uh, but in any case, this has to come with some counterpart in terms of contribution to the financing of public goods, of uh, public infrastructure. So this is not... We can, we, I think we all know that, that we cannot continue in the 21st century, you know, with a regime of uh, free capital flows, which means capital flows with no counterpart in terms of taxation. I mean, I, th I think we all know that, you know, I think we've started, including at the uh, OECD, uh, to, to think about, you know, automatic transmission of information about foreign assets. So, so you know, we, we now we need to, uh, to, to be serious about what progress have we made, how are we going to make progress in this direction. But we cannot uh, uh, accept the idea to keep this, this, uh, this legal system in place. You told me, uh, so to, to be a bit more specific about your question, you, know, you, you said, uh, what about small, medium-sized companies? Yeah, you know, you have to look at a progressive tax schedule, you know, when you, but, you, know, when you own 200 uh, billion uh, uh, dollars, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's possible that you, that you sell some of your assets, uh, you know, to pay, to pay for the tax. You know, re remember, you know, 10 years ago, you know, the top billionaire in the world, they were only, they had only 30 or 40 billion dollars each. Now they have 200. So you can see that you know this is this is really an explosive pass. And if you ask me, what difference does it make to have 200 rather than 30? Well, the difference is that when you have 200, you can buy something worth 30 or 40, uh, like for instance, called Twitter, and you even you don't notice it because you have 200. And, and in terms of you know impact on the overall uh, you know democratic institution, etc., you know I think we 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 have to be serious about that. Then you know how can people pay for their wealth tax? Look, if, if it's really complicated to sell your shares to anyone, you can think of various schemes where, uh, uh, you know, employees in the firm, uh, engineers, you know, could purchase some of the shares, you know, the state could be, the government could be paid in shares and then there's a loan uh, allowing uh, employees to buy some of these shares. But, you know, the, the bottom line 
is that there are lots of people, uh, you know, uh, thousands and millions of, you know, engineers, technicians, uh, you know, we live in very educated society. Uh, uh, you have lots of people who can participate to the decision making process of companies and who could own more shares in these companies. You know, the idea is that we need to have a, a sort of monarchical uh, concentration of uh, economic power with one individual who owns uh, 200 billion or 100 billion and take all the decision himself or herself, well, usually himself uh, for, for the next uh, 50 years or 60 years. You know, it's, it's really a completely crazy economic system as, as compared to the reality of the societies in which we live, where, you know, the diffusion of knowledge and, uh, and education, you know, has never been as large as it is today. So um, now on the practicalities or, you know, what you do with, with people moving around their wealth, well, you, as I was saying earlier, you have to change these rules. So just to take an example, you know, if we take, a, you know, you probably noticed in the 2020 Uh, presidential uh, uh, election in the US during the primary election for the Democratic uh, Party, uh, Warren and Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders were both proposing uh, wealth tax with a top wealth tax rate up to 8% per year on billionaires, which is a lot more than the, the kind of wealth tax we've, we've seen in the past in, in Europe. And they were starting by billionaires just to make sure that Here, this is well enforced, and then you can move down the road. But you know, they were starting with a well schedule, starting quite high, you know, at 50 million dollars, just to make sure that you know, here there's no liquidity problem for paying the tax. And, and also, I think the strategy was to say we want to make sure that the people at the top are really paying the tax before you can go down the distribution, because otherwise, you know, people who have uh, who own five or two million, you know, they are not going to accept paying this if, if you know people at the very top don't pay. Now there were two important ingredients in the Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders proposal in order to make it viable. The first thing is that in the U.S., you know, you, as long as you have the U.S. citizenship you need to pay your tax. So, okay, you want to go to Switzerland, uh, you're still, um, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're still a US citizen, you have to pay your tax. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, okay, you want to drop your US citizenship, you want to take Swiss citizenship or Qatari citizenship, you can do that. But then you will pay an exit tax of, you know, so there were different proposals like 20%, 40%, 60%. So, you know, we're still, we are, we are not in free capital flow anymore. Because, okay, you can move your capital, but you will have to keep, uh, to leave 60, 50% or 60% back in your country, which, which makes a lot of sense because in the end, you know, this wealth was not accumulated in a vacuum. You know, if you don't have the, the US university system, the public infrastructure, the legal system, how do you accumulate wealth? So, you know, the view that, uh, that wealth is accumulated by private individuals just through their own genius and, you know, it's an ideological construction that has no meaning. Practically, you know, it, it relies entirely on this set of public institutions which need to be paid for. And so, you know, I, I, this, this is the only way. So, so this will have to come through a big transformation of the notion of uh, the very notion of capital, uh, capital mobility, which needs to have some counterpart in terms of taxation. So we are back to the beginning. No, ju just one word on that, uh, where I think that... Um, The progress that has been made at the OECD with the automatic exchange of information uh, is one aspect of the question that simplify, let's say, would simplify, you know, the putting together uh, some sort of wealth taxation that would be internationally co coordinated. Because in the absence of the automatic exchange of information, it's very difficult uh, to achieve this. Now there are some loopholes. Uh, one is uh, the fact that now rich people uh, want to hide their wealth in uh, residential wealth. Um, and that's why we are starting a conversation about, you know, eventually including uh, automatic exchange of information about housing, I mean, housing residential property. Um, so all of this to say that we, I mean, we do have the tools um, to, to do in this direction. Whether we have the political <laughs> commitment uh, is another story. Um, but we, we do have the tools. And then one last point, because I think that, okay, today we speak about inequality, we spoke a lot about taxation. But uh, one thing that Thomas just mentioned is uh, mobility of capital. 
mobility of labor or you know mobility of people and i think that you know we cannot close this session without just one word on international migration and what has happened 10 days ago in greece which i think is should be an alarm bell all over the place and uh, if you compare you know the news about this and the um, submarine um, i mean i have no comment on that and i think we as you know intellectual experts etc we should probably put more efforts in um, working on this topic because it's it's very important from multiple aspects yeah um however we're gonna have to do that in another mm -hmm. session because we have reached six o'clock and i feel that in the interest of equality you ought to go and disagree about this yourselves um just uh, one thing that uh, I noticed in the news a couple of weeks ago, we found out that Jeff Bezos's yacht has a yacht. So he's someone who's not hiding his wealth anyway, let that sink in. Um, thank you very much, Ozed. <laughs> thank you very much, Toma. And uh, thank you very much for all of you uh, for uh, staying with us for this. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I didn't have to do very much this time round. So thank you for both of our panelists for saving me the work. <laughs>